Okay, I'm speaking with uh, Lorraine from the uh, Nunavut Broadband Development Corporation. I just want to know, Lorraine, uh, when you're putting the uh, or involved in putting the Broadband uh, Development Corporation together, what types of challenges did you encounter, or what types of problems did it solve uh, for the Nunavut uh, people? Okay, that's a big question. First, the issue was that most of our communities, a few had local dial-up servers, but most were dialing up long distance over telephones that were connected via satellite. So, to download an anti-Norton virus patch, weekly virus patch, would take maybe three or four hours. Great. Impossible. So, to run a business, to run a hamlet, to run an organization, to do training, to, to support students, without a network, we really... You know, I always say the leave is hugely. So now when Industry Canada announced a program to help broaden get into rural and remote communities, we put together, according to their guidelines, a community champion. So that's a challenge because there's no money to create those. There's no matching funds in the north to match any kind of investment that's made at the federal level. Federal government, you know, tends to want to only give 50 cents on every dollar that they invest because they want to see local guys step up at the plate. It's a good idea. Right. We just don't have any local money kicking around. It's just not there, at least not for this at that time. So we put together a 600-page business plan, ran an RFP, a company bid, brilliant. I mean, our RFP was very specific that it had to meet an ability to do what we call meshed, so that because it's satellite served, you need a mesh network so that all the different endpoints can talk to each other. If you don't have a mesh network, right. it, it will not. So every, all the traditional vendors said you can't have a mesh network. You'll never get the money. This guy said, we can make a mesh, mesh network. We can make it work, and we can do it for an affordable price. Put together the business plan, brilliant. The trick was, Industry Canada came back and said, you can't have the 7.3, you need, you can have 3.8. And you only have a month to find another 4 million. <laughs> that was a big challenge. But we got some debt financing, we got a little bit of money from an Inuit organization um, training group. Gave us a loan guarantee. They never, we never did get the money from them, but they gave us a loan guarantee, which was a big deal, $227,000. Like out of a $10 million project, we were short sure $227,000 at one point. I had from a Friday to a Monday to get that organized. Very complicated, very political, very hard. Right. So it was the financial administration setup that was by far the hardest. Right. Once we got that in place, and, and all the business planning and all the rest of it, and then the, the guys who built the network were fantastic. Like, I don't know how you could have done this with anybody else, because they, we said, we don't have the money yet, but we have to meet this deadline. We don't have to sign contract yet. Do you want to start? They went out and buy stuff. Like they'd say, we believe in this. This has to happen. The guy that owns it grew up in a community of 700 people. Right. So they had this vision. Even though they're a private sector company, they had this vision that what they wanted to do was build the best satellite network on earth to serve the remote community. And luckily for us, they picked Nunavut. So, so that with, was with it. It was the financial administration that was the okay. hardest, hardest, hardest part because we don't have any contract CAs in California. Well, there's one now, but like it's not like you can just go to the right. next door and find someone who's got the knowledge to pull that together. So luckily we had this guy in Ottawa, 65 years old, semi-retired, been in IT for 50 years, <laughs> forever, right. before IT existed. And um, he came to Nunavut as the chief information officer before the Nunavut government got set up. Right. He loved it. Thought it was great. He said, I like going to a place where I can wear all my clothes from work, work to workhouse. I'll work with you, Lorraine. Right on. So we got this guy. Work, work, work. First year he never got paid anything. Worked for free for a year. Wow. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, I work for free lots too. <laughs> but, you know, who can say when they die? I got to do one really good thing. I can say yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> you have to be part of so one really good thing, so it was worth it. That's that's a great uh, great comment. Uh, what what's your uh, what was your motivation then? Because obviously going through this, the, the administrative end, you're going to look at it and you're going to say, I mean, to put together 600 page RFPs, uh, it's not a smooth process. The RFP so, was only 50, but the business time is 600. Uh, so the network agreement is 1100. Uh, okay, ah! so so <laughs> in order to produce those kinds of documents, those are significant hurdles. What's your motivating influence that kept you going during that time that's frame? That's a great question. Nobody ever asked me that question. I started out in the North 20 years ago teaching television production to Inuit in a small community named Labrador. They wanted to use TV as a tool. I was a television person to promote and preserve their language and culture. I thought, now that's a good use for TV. The rest of it I don't get. But anyhow, I go there. I loved it. Two years ago to Rankin. And, and that was the head office. All the people were there. It was 20 people. They had radio, print, TV. It was great. I go to Rankin Inlet. There's four staff. The head office is in Ottawa. My peers are in Cambridge Bay and Academy. I had no access to any resources. It was very hard to teach with no resources. I mean no resources. So I teach, I do my best, I do it for eight months. I moved to Ottawa, start a new company for to right. raise money for the NPO, which was doing broadcasting. And I went back to university to go do media literacy for kids. That's what I wanted to do, teaching, right? right. 
curriculum development, actually. And I discovered the internet, 1992. <laughs> this professor said, you can't afford not to take my course. you got to take my course. I take it. <gasps> oh, my God. Everything's going to converge someday. And Nunavut has no idea that they're missing this. They have no infrastructure, and nobody's even talking about it. <gasps> I was panicked, panicked, panicked. <laughs> Freenet starting. This is the thing that would have changed my life as a teacher in Rankin. It would have changed my life. I could have projected to the sky. And I thought conversion would happen a lot faster. I didn't think it would I think take most this of long. us did, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I thought by 96, 97, it'll all be conversion, that'd be that. It's happening now. So I busted my butt in the early 90s. To 1995, we had a big conference. We used television. We had communities calling and dialing and faxing in any way they could connect to this conference. It was great. We presented a thousand pages with the RTC, Francis Fox, Information Highway Advisory Council. We said, this is the answer for Nunavut. We need the money. Let's get going. We got this. We got that. Everybody's on board. It went nowhere. Yeah. Dead silence at the I have meeting when it was presented, no one knew what to say. Oh my god, they have research. <laughs> so it went nowhere. I moved to Thailand. I came back. I started working for a company in Ottawa. I did a lot of work up here. I moved back here in 98. And then in 2002, fall of 2002, Neil Burgess, the guy we keep talking about, approached me and said, hey, there might be some money at the federal level to make this finally happen. I'm like, I'm going to do it again. I tried too hard. We failed. They're not going to do it. I, I can't do it. So there was a bunch of people. Every time I went, Lorraine, you want to come? Come on, there's no Nobody else. Yeah, nobody else will work for free 100 hours a day. <laughs> they could have said. Uh, at the time of my life, I just had a baby. I came off maternity leave early. My husband was making a decent regular wage, so I was able to do it. So I used to joke, you know, we got a semi-retired guy and a stay-at-home mom. That's when we made it happen. But my motivation was knowing what it feels like to be in a community with my family, a few friends, a bunch of students, and nobody supporting. If I'd had the kind of tools that should have been available a long time ago in Nunavut, it would have changed my experience. Great. Yeah, Thanks it. very much.